So, good afternoon. Now for something completely different. I um, hope you can all hear me okay. So, going to be quite a fast-paced presentation. Um, I'm not going to get it too technical, fairly high level. Um, there's a huge amount of information on our website, which is pentestpartners.com slash blog. Uh, also, as I go through the presentation, uh, we have an IoT toolkit. Um, please ask me for that. There's a lot of information in there about design from a hardware perspective, uh, development and process. Um, you can't get it from a web page, so you don't need to put your details in. You won't get followed up by salespeople. Just drop me an email, just let me know you'd like a copy, and I'm happy to forward it to you. Uh, so, how am I? Uh, good afternoon. So, my name is Nigel Hearn. Um, I'm a, uh, an ex engineer from an electronics and fiber optics background. Uh, I've worked in IT security since 1999. And with Pentest Partners, I'm a senior consultant and a project manager. So I get some, to manage some really interesting projects, mainly today around the Internet of Things, uh, some big red team tests, and uh, some interesting stuff around Maritime. That's uh, a MOS Maritime CS55, which I'll talk about briefly, and some of the kit that we were working on as a result of that project, which I think is relevant to uh, what you guys and ladies are doing. Um, so very briefly about Pentest Partners, and this is probably the closest thing you'll get from me today as a, as a sales pitch. So we are, do many people in here know PTP? Few of you, okay. So we're quite well known in the, in the security and penetration testing space. We're the largest independently owned uh, pure play pen testing company in the UK. Uh, we're about 100 employees founded in 19, 2008, so we're, whatever it is, 12 years old or something now. Um, we're very well known for being security researchers and bloggers. Uh, if you put pen testing into the BBC website, you'll find us about 300 times. Uh, that's the guys that we did a, an expose, which I'll talk about a bit later on, uh, for BBC Click. You may have seen us on Panorama just before Christmas talking about um, uh, connected homes. Um, and we're very well known for the traditional stuff, so web applications, external infrastructure, um, but particularly for hardware reverse engineering. We do a lot of work in the, in the Meditech space, in automotive, in IoT, and the internet, uh, internet of things. And then Red Team, and there's that reference up there to CBEST and GBEST. Um, they're the very high-end security audits for, sponsored by the Cabinet Office, in the case of GBEST for government departments, the top 30 government departments, and CBEST run by the Bank of England for the key financial services organisations. And then STAR, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, Qualifications, we have all the badges, so you know, that's why we're hopefully qualified to be here. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about this one. This was a STAR project, so a big red team event, um, not unlike CBS, so not uh, controlled by government. Um, and one of our clients asked us to understand uh, what would the implications be if somebody tried to compromise their drilling rig. I put this picture up for a couple of reasons. Uh, that's my two colleagues, Roger and, uh, and Chris, at the bottom. This was warm stacked in a harbour in West Africa and that's 287 steps to come up there. It's a very long way up, and poor old Roger is terrified of heights, and he's a smoker, so that's why he had to stand to have a cigarette. So uh, apologies to him. So the two guys in the pictures, we have a very strong background in critical national infrastructure, and that's taken us on a fascinating journey over the last five or six years into hardware and the Internet of Things, and lots of these connected devices that we're all talking about over today and, and, and tomorrow. Um, a couple of examples. Chris um, used to be responsible for um, uh, 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 Scala Security for West Water. Um, Roger in the picture used to run um, Scala Security for EDF Energy across Europe. Um, and they brought some of that knowledge into, into our IoT world. And I include this picture of the, of the um, manufacturing plant. Chris, when he left um, uh, EDF, moved on to Dyson. He used to run security for Dyson across the world. Um, and I thought I'd include this picture, which isn't dice, it's a stock photo. But if those of you that have ever been to a robotic manufacturing plant, they don't look like this, because they're always in the dark. And I quite like that, because you've rarely seen with the lights on, if you actually go there. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, some equipment that we looked at on, on this project. This was a paid project for one of our clients, um, but we can discuss some of the technology uh, but we were allowed to release it under responsible dis uh, disclosure. Um, we don't, uh, if we're doing paid work, it doesn't go to the public domain, um, but we do give our engineers um, about 20% of their working week to do research in R&D. Um, it means that they're happy individuals and they get to learn interesting stuff and do training courses, which is why we've only lost um, three employees since we founded the company, which in a, in a pen testing space is very, very unusual. 
Um, and our clients in this scenario said, um, could you, is it possible to drive a drilling rig off station and compromise the blowout protector? So I'll talk about a couple of the technologies as we went through this journey um, of how we managed to demonstrate that is potentially possible. Um, the BOP was always secure, um, but a lot of these now are becoming more internet connected, so I'm not sure what the future will bring. But I'm going to start with some talk about a cup of tea. Um, I couldn't bring my eye kettle with me. I was going to give you a demonstration, but I broke it at the weekend, so apologies. But um, this is quite an interesting start when we talk about um, uh, the, choosing the equipment that you use to put into your IoT scenario. So this is a great thing. This is a, an IoT kettle. It's called an eye kettle. It's only £100 more than an ordinary kettle, and for that you get a mobile app, and you can decide to boil it when you get out of bed. And if you're going to have coffee, you can boil it, boil it at 98 degrees, if it's tea, boil it at 100 degrees. Great, great value for money. So how do you hack an eye kettle? Well, actually, you, on this scenario, you just take the bottom off, and that's the Wi-Fi board. So they fitted a Wi-Fi board into the bottom of a, a pretty standard kettle. Um, and for some people that are getting into connected devices, perhaps you, you, some of you will go and buy a module and put it into something you're going to build and hopefully take out to the market. Uh, may not be Wi-Fi, might be talking across LoRa or, or, or whatever it might be. But the way to hack this is simply to read the manual. Um, we downloaded this manual from the internet, and you learn a number of things. Um, you can get the manual, and it tells you the default login is, I think that's six zeros. Not sure if I can count, quite count so that many. Is it there somewhere? Six zeros. Um, it also tells you the command and the string you need to extract the Wi-Fi key in plain text. So all you need to do is connect to it and extract its Wi-Fi key. Now, we reported this to ICANN. This is a few years ago, and they fixed it now. But they went, OK, but it's, it's quite a sophisticated hack. You need specialist knowledge. No, you don't. Get the manual off the internet. Um, and also, you need to be able to find one. And you won't know where they are. So the way the iKettle works, you connect it to your home network, and it has an SSID, which is what it's called. And they're all called iKettle. So I don't know if many of you have heard of a, of a, of a website called Wiggle. Wiggle allows you to put in an SSID of a device, and people drive around with their mobile phone or their laptop on, and every time they detect a Wi-Fi access point, it logs its GPS location, and they kindly upload it to Wiggle. Turns out you can find lots of kettles in London, um, so you can find them. I'm actually going to concentrate on that one down there, which is in Q, Q Road in um, at Richmond. So the kettle I was going to bring with me that I broke at the weekend, I bought on eBay. And I bought it on eBay from a, a, a user called Richie Rich 73 I got it home, I plugged it in, and the first thing it does is try to connect to the home router that it used to connect to, because he hadn't deleted the files from it. So his router tries to, his uh, kettle tries to connect to his router. So I'm now sniffing, and I've now got his SSID. I know what his home router's called. I put that into Wiggle, and I get his address. Or I, I get the location, which is that one on the map. So I then go to 192.com, and I look up the people that live in Q Road, Richmond. And there's a bloke called Richard Richardson. I don't reckon that's going to be Richie Rich 73, do you? Uh, so I phoned him up, because he had a phone number, and I've changed it slightly, and I said, hello, it's Peter Pan 1001, I bought your eye kettle. He's like, how did you get my number? So I recounted him my tail and explained to him that he really should think about changing his Wi-Fi key on his home router. Do you think he did? I bet he hasn't. Um, the moral there is two, twofold, really. When you're choosing parts for your IoT device, Think about the bit you're, you're buying um, and how it fits into your ecosystem. Um, think about the, the, the IoT design information we can give you. There's some, some steps and questions you can ask that's really useful. Also, in that device, there was no way of updating the firmware. So that kettle was, is vulnerable for the rest of its lifetime. An important lesson there again when you're, when you're building or buying kit. Um, version 3 is really good, um, and you can update it. Finding things on the internet. Who's heard of Shodan? Okay, so Shodan's a little bit like Wiggle. Doesn't tell you where something is, but tells you what something is. 
So you can fingerprint hardware devices that appear on the public internet. That's an example I was asked to search for Sailor 900, uh, which is a SATCOM uh, um, uh, hardware modem, and there were 51 of them. And it will give you the information it knows about it, its IP address. Um, and if you start to know things about these devices, it may well be that they're vulnerable and you can exploit them. It's really fascinating what Showdown will show you. Here's a couple of examples. Now, the presentations earlier on this morning were talking about IoT-enabled cows and how on a farm in New Zealand that's really quite useful, understand where your cattle are, what they're doing, etc. This device we've identified via Showdown. Now, I don't know what it is. It's in Korean, we think. Google Translate wasn't terribly helpful, but it's clearly something to do with cattle. Um, maybe a dairy, but um, I'm not sure why you want to milk a baby cow. Um, this appears on the public internet with default credentials. Admin, admin. In fact, in the, in the case of this one, which is something to do with a, I'm guessing a water treatment plant, I'm guessing the, the, the tanks are levels. In both of these scenarios, you could start changing things on these uh, devices. That has no username and password connected to it at all. It's on port 8080 on the public internet. This one is admin, admin. Um, and so one of these people start, we'll talk about applications briefly a bit later on. Um, it's fascinating what can be on the internet um, and maybe your devices, your nodes are talking across Laura and into a gateway, the gateway is talking into a hub, ultimately into a back-end system that is visible on the internet. So I'm a, we're assuming this is some sort of hub or a gateway sat within a plant or a, or a dairy or manufacturing site somewhere. And you find other things too. So some more examples. Um, that's a PLC, a programmable logic controller, turns things on and off. This one's really quite scary. Um, this is a sanitation unit, disinfectant unit for an air conditioning system. So it's designed to prevent you getting Legionnaire's disease. Um, it's on the public internet. Again, default, app, default password and, and username. Uh, there are hundreds of these available today. Um, so when you think about how you deploy your system in a large ecosystem, and have a think about where is it visible, what are the defaults, why would you want to give anything default credentials, make a user change it at the moment of installation. Um, and things going in over time. Um, we used to talk about this device, there were hundreds of these in Terminal 5. Um, it's a building management control system. They're used for opening, closing windows and doors, all those types of ventilation, etc. could be any type of thing. Um, you can connect them all together, you can daisy chain them. Um, and the early ones had a couple of known vulnerabilities. Um, first of all, it would port forward on port 80, so it has a web interface, and by default it's available. If the, if the, if the area of the network of th that device is on, has got access to the public internet, it sits on the public internet by default. There was no encryption or login. It was on port 80, not port 8080, so no SSL. And there was a complete user bypass issue. So if you can get to it, you went to users, you could create yourself an admin user without being logged in. And once you're an admin user, you have complete control over the device. This was when T5 first opened, so, you know, I wasn't great then. Um, as of today, there are still over a thousand um, vulnerable, unpatched systems on the internet, including these have both gone now, one in an Air Force base and one in a, in a, uh, a UK university. Um, so there's a, there's a lesson about patching there, which I'll come back to again shortly. How long have I been? Oh, um, a bit of fun. Um, this is a bit of research we did. We decided to write a script to look for vulnerable satellite communication equipment, so SATCOM or maritime uh, shipping. Um, we then cross-correlated the ships against AIS data, which is public available, and that was a real-time map of vulnerable SATCOMs fitted to shipping that were exploitable in real time. Uh, I presented that slide to the Houses of Parliament a few months ago. So let's talk about cloud. Lots of, people, lots of stuff we hear about today, with your, the sensors you're building, the data you're taking, ultimately is going to go into the cloud and, and create big data. Um, which is great, it's the way the world's going. With big data comes big challenges, and particularly with APIs. I'm going to give some examples of what an API is and why if you're, if you're building a community, you're building infrastructure, you're getting suppliers, some of the things you need to ensure that those people are providing for you um, 
and, uh, and we're not presenting vulnerabilities. So I'm going to talk about car alarms. I think we can all relate to car alarms, but this could equally be the data that sits in your platform with process data or location data, or it could be anything else. So one of my colleagues had a Pandora alarm, a very expensive alarm, fitted to his Range Rover, about 600 quid, these things. And the website makes all these claims about being unhackable. Don't ever say your product's unhackable. Don't, don't ever raise that red rag to, to people like us. So we thought we'd, talk, we'd look at this. It's got, made lots of claims about encryption and what they do, and double encryption, military grade. Um, all nonsense. Uh, or, or in fact, all irrelevant. So the mobile application, simply you could, you could do remote control functions on the mobile phone. So you could figure out where your car is, you could lock or unlock it, you could start it and stop it, or you could set the panic alarm off. So all very good, mobile app, perfect. Now with a mobile app and an API, there are a couple of terms that I'll explain to you. So there's authentication and there's authorization. Authentication is, are you who you say you are? So as you log in, you may try to start a session, you might get a cookie, it's, it knows that you are John Smith and you're definitely John Smith. Then there's authorization, which is, are you allowed to do what you've just tried to do? And with an API, an application program interface, is the little, the screen you get on your, on your, on your phone, it has two concepts, a get and a post. A get is when you press the button and it goes and gets you some information, and a post is when you press the button and it gives something back, so you might have entered a value or something. Now, this particular application was doing the authentication really well, but they slipped up badly on the authorization, and this is very, very common. Um, and we find this a lot through our paid testing and also through our research. So in this example, the email, we were able to, at the top, you have the user ID, which we've starred out, but you could change the user ID from me to somebody else, and then you could change the email address. So I could change it from John Smith's email address to Nigel Hearn's email address. Then I could do a password reset, and it sends that reset request to my email address. I type my new password. I've now got control of his account. So I can geolocate his vehicle. I can turn the alarm off. I do all sorts of things. We then wrote a script to enumerate every single user using a Pandora alarm. So I've now got everybody. I can choose the Range Rover that's just along the road at Beaconsfield. I can drive up to it. I can set off his panic alarm. If your panic alarm goes off, what are you going to do? You're probably going to stop, right? The moment your car stops, I can stop your engine and immobilize your vehicle and unlock your doors. Not good. We looked at Viper, um, a big US brand. That was even worse because I didn't even have to do the password reset. I could just change the username and change the password by manipulating the application, and I've got complete control, control of all of those vehicles anyway. This, this affected something like four and a half million vehicles globally. Um, and I'll just give you the, the next example, which is Tracker. Um, who's got a Tracker fitted to their vehicle? Hmm, surprise, none of you. But because, so these are all fixed. We just responsibly disclosed these. So a Tracker, in theory, it tells you if your car's been stolen, um, if it breaks a geofence, if it's moved, um, it tells the alerting center, they contact you. You go, oh, yes, it's not me. So they report it to the police, tell the police where it is, and they go get your car back. Well, that's how it should work, right? So with Tracker, which you get a reduction in insurance premium to get this thing installed in your car, it made it much easier for us to steal it. So we could uh, enumerate the user account and change the user account details. We could unsubscribe you from alerts altogether, so you're not going to get alerts say your vehicle's been stolen. Or in fact, we could delete the, geo, the geolocation altogether. So the geofence has gone. If your vehicle moves, we put it on a trailer, there will be no alert because A, we've turned them off, and it's not going to alert you. Um, and actually, with that one, got even worse because we realized actually they were passing all of the data um, from the application into an insecure SQL database. We didn't touch it, but we believe that's all the data for every user stored in an unsecure server. So hopefully a few lessons there. How long have I got? Oh, loads of time. So, something a little bit closer to home, hacking uh, hardware and industrial control systems. So, this is a, a SATCOM device, so a satellite communication modem that sits on a vessel, um, and you'd use it to communicate back and forth. 
Um, so we do, we, talk, we do a lot of what's hardware reverse engineering. So in the lab at the moment, we've got a CT scanner, we've got a cache machine, we had a genome sequencer last week, uh, we get cars in there, motorbikes, all sorts of things. So the way we, we look at compromising a device these days is not just its, act, its connection points, its Ethernet, its Bluetooth, its BLE, but also what can we learn from the hardware. Because with hardware, a threat actor or a nation state can buy one, glean knowledge from it, and then to try and attack either your equipment, your infrastructure, your organization. And as we learned recently from the, uh, um, the recent disclosure with one of the big airline man or, um, uh, aer aerospace manufacturers, um, to use your equipment, perhaps as a pivot point, to attack the, the onward organization. Um, so we do a number of things, and one of the things we do is glitching. Um, the ability to uh, trick the, uh, the device into giving us the firmware whilst it's loading the firmware. It's amazing what we find in firmware information, um, undocumented accounts, uh, uh, hard-coded credentials within firmware. Um, we can find ways of uh, compromising the hardware, and it's, this was actually in this SATCOM, the reason I use this example. So the person that developed that code within the firmware has written Space, space com protection, Chuck Norris kills you. People don't realize that people than us can read that sort of stuff. Um, so it's a good example of other stuff we find in there. So I'm going to give you a, oh, a couple of examples from, this is from the drilling rig. So um, I'm going to give you this very briefly. On our website, we have a blog post that explains this. We have a very comprehensive white paper that explains how we, re how we reverse engineered uh, this piece of equipment. Um, I'm going to refer to my notes, so I'll call it the right thing. So this is, it's an E1 Flexi. Um, it's used for remote access where there isn't consistent internet access. So it might be Wi-Fi, it might be 4 or 5G, um, some sort of VPN, um, it might be um, uh, over a private APN. And it's to provide you an out-of-band connection. There are thousands of these fitted all over the world. Um, you can find thousands of them on, on Showdown. Uh, there were some known issues with it um, back in 2005, uh, which uh, Carl, I, I referenced down there, um, and he identified. We thought we'd take a different approach um, of the way to compromise this device. Um, it's worth reading the, uh, um, uh, the stuff on the web if you're technical, um, but effectively we were able to um, unlock the locked bootloader so we could get access to the code. Um, and get access to the firmware. When we also bought one, we realized that it allowed you to set a password of three characters. So we could set the password and see what the password hash was, the encrypted version. So we tried AAA, ABA, BBB, CCC. Um, and from that, we started to get an understanding of how they were using uh, their encryption. Um, we then ended up going to a password length of 22 characters and we wrote a script based on the knowledge the guys had learned from doing this. We reverse engineered the key. Um, what we were then ultimately able to understand was um, the way that they were doing their key management. If you compromised one device, um, you could then compromise all of the devices they'd, they'd issued globally. I'm gonna show you another example of that as well. So because of a number of the ways that we're able to compromise the device, it's a very long blog post, um, we then would disclose to them that every single device they'd made um, had the same vulnerability. Um, and it took them months and months and months to eventually fix the issue. Um, I'll give you a bit more details on a, on a second one. This is something called a Scalance switch. Um, there were hundreds of these on the drilling rig. There were hundreds of thousands of these fitted globally. Um, they're all over manufacturing plants and all sorts of places. The sort of places that some of your kit may eventually go into, um, you never know. Um, this resulted in a, in a, in a, in a high um, uh, uh, advisory um, and a really interesting approach that when we looked at it, um, we noticed a couple of things. We had access to the, to the um, admin panel because we bought some devices. And if we use password or password one, two, three, the, the hashes of the passwords were different lengths. Um, and that indi indicated to us some form of block encryption. So we thought, you know what, there's an opportunity here that we might be able to look at this. Um, but we didn't have access to the firmware. Um, there were thousands of these, and ultimately, well, I'll talk you through how we managed to, to compromise this device. 
The other thing that was really interesting is when you created an admin password, it created two password hashes, so two encrypted passwords. That's very unusual, and that made us start to raise alarm bells that why would you want two? What's the second one for? Um, very unusual. Um, so we went the full Wade on this. We've got a very talented guy that works for us called Chris Wade. Um, and we didn't have access to the, to the, we only had the encrypted version of the, of the, of the, um, the firmware, the source, of, so the binary. So Chris started to understand that actually that it was an, it was an ARM because the E's were a bit of a giveaway. Um, I'm going to refer to my notes now. So we know it's own firmware. firmware. Um, we loaded that into something called IDA, some of you will be familiar with, um, but we didn't know where the entry point was. So we didn't know where that code started and stopped. Um, so eventually, Chris find, found, found an entry point, so made some sense of what the code was doing. Um, and um, so we knew that the software was VXWorks. Um, I'll jump through some of these. Did some other really clever stuff. Understood what the key was. Um, we knew it was probably, um, probably Blowfish was the encryption. Um, but we got to a point where Chris could actually go to GitHub and actually download the exact Blowfish library that they're using for, the, for, the, for that part of the code. Um, we then went back to the hardware in its, in its hardware form um, and started running um, the application tied onto JTAG. Um, and we were able then to look at various of the registry settings as we're trying to do different things. Um, so ultimately, what we discovered, they had something called an ELS key and ELS debug with the two static keys um, on that device. Um, and there's a moral here about, um, this is a, a very long blog post. It's well worth reading if you're, if you're um, engineers. Um, but we understood that actually they were using um, the same key for all of their Siemens equipment. Um, and there were hundreds of thousands of these things around. Unlike the E1 Flexi, Siemens were fantastic. Um, we dis responsibly disclosed it to them. They engaged with us the same day. Um, they engaged their engineers with our team. They understood the gravity of what the issue was, um, and they worked really hard to fix it. So if anybody works with Siemens, they, they did a fantastic job. Um, all credit to them. Then they made a, a big song and dance of it to their customers to say, this is a really big issue. You need to go and fix it. One of the problems we have in, in IoT space is people don't tell their clients to go and patch stuff. Some of the stuff can't be patched, but they don't tell stuff. I thought I'd give you a quick example of SATCOM where people get it really wrong. So this was a SATCOM vendor. This is now fixed. It's a SATCOM vendor called CTEL. And they put out a release saying, we've made general improvements to the security for an admin account. So if you had a job to do, if you're going to patch stuff, is that the most important thing you're going to do today? Probably not the most important thing on my job list I'm going to do today. So I thought I'd show you what that looks like. So general improvements to um, the admin account. If you go on to Shodan, you can identify one of, these, one of these boxes. You pop the IP address into your browser, and it takes you to the um, login panel for that SATCOM fitted to that vessel. If you right-click and go view source, it'll show you the, the source for that page. This bit it's a little bit JavaScript. Probably a bit small for you there. But it says, if the username is sysadmin and the password is correct, <laughs> Go to menu sysgx.htm. No, really? You just put that after the IP address, and you're signed in with a full authentication bypass to the admin panel of that SATCOM. General improvements to the security of the admin account? Really? They should be ashamed of themselves. Unfortunately, within the IoT space, if you can update the device in the first place, a lot of people don't say about it. So don't, you know, le please learn that lesson. Um, briefly, I'm going to sort of try to wrap up. Um, stalking children, let's bring this one slightly closer to the home. Um, getting things fixed and th get things patched. Uh, one of my colleagues bought a watch for their child. So put this on, on your child's wrist. It's got GPS, you've got a mobile app, you know where your child is, you can see where they've been. Um, you can send them a message to say, be home in 10 minutes. You can phone them up and they come up and it says, Dad. And it's like, where are you? I'm just coming around the corner, Dad. 
um, Auntie Jane's, whatever it might be. The trouble is this one had the same issues as the, uh, the, mobile app, the, uh, the vehicle applications. We could geolocate any child, enumerate every single child, every single email address. We could locate where they were, look at historical data so we know they go into the same playground every Wednesday afternoon, change the telephone number, so my telephone number now appears as dad on the mobile phone, and say, can you meet Uncle John on the corner by the playground in 10 minutes? Really scary. We disclosed this to a number of vendors that used the same piece of hardware produced by a manufacturer in China. We've never to this day been able to get a response from the Chinese manufacturer who made, made the chip that goes inside it. They've never responded to us, and there are many of these devices that are still vulnerable. A couple of the manufacturers came back to us, worked with us, and they fixed their mobile app. Great. One of the manufacturers said, oh, what's it going to cost me? It's like a few thousand quid. And the words were, and I quote, are, oh, but if we fix that, we won't be able to afford to have a Christmas party. Now, her priorities laid. So I'm going to leave you with not feeling the people issue. So some, some takeaways really about, you know, ask for IoT handbook, some advice on the chips that you use to, to start with, how you design it. If you can get security at the beginning, it makes your life so much easier at the end. Stuff that you can update. Don't trust half this stuff you buy from China because it's cheap and it's tough to take me. It's reason it's tough to take me because you'll never be able to update it. It'll be insecure. If you choose something, get somebody like us to have a look at what you've decided to integrate. Um, we do some, some big testing for our clients where we look at end-to-end -end solutions. So we'll look at the node. The node's talking over LoRaWAN to a hub, the hub. And we do end-to-end -end testing. Sometimes, actually, if they'd chosen a different device at the beginning over here, it would have made the whole process much more secure. Um, and then people are the, are the missing link. I'm told you always need, oh, need something funny in your presentation, so I'm going to leave you with this one. Um, we're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. Gemma. One, two, three. Spell G-E-M-M-A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like so what, like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your uh, grandma's name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. Ah, oh, damn.